Moving back and forth across the ice more than any other single factor that made it possible for us to complete Camp Century on schedule. 25,000 gallons of diesel fuel, 110 tons, an all-time record sled load. The continuous flow of tractor trains bringing in enormous cargoes were like the dependable tortoise, slow but steady. But they were our lifeline. To service our many vehicles, a maintenance shop was constructed closer to the surface, both as a repair shop and as a garage. For the sub-zero temperatures meant equipment had to be kept warm. Otherwise, engines wouldn't start, lubricating oil solidified, and electrical connections froze. It was at this time that the Marine Fiddler arrived at Thule with the nuclear power plant. Designed for air transportability, but transported by sea to reduce costs, the nuclear plant was the last major phase of our operation and the most difficult. This unit, for example, part of a vapor container, weighed more than 21 tons. Awkward to handle and with high centers of gravity, these packages were delivered to the ice cap over a road built specifically for their transport. More than 400 tons of piping and machinery arrived in this one shipment. Since the Arctic cold makes metal very brittle, each unit had to be handled with great care. Even a routine impact could cause metal to crack or break. Both Colonel Kirkering and the swing commander checked the loading. The vapor container, the largest single item in the power plant, was carried on a special flat bottom sled built expressly for its transport. Everything seemed fine the morning the heavy swing moved out. But unfortunately, it was only a few hours later that one of the worst storms of the season blew up. To complete preparations to receive the nuclear plant, my crews bundled up and kept on working. The opening in the roof of the main nuclear trench now had to be closed quickly before the trench began filling with snow. Despite the storm, the heavy swing was still moving. At our end, my crews kept working. It was the only way we could be ready. Out on the ice, the storm cleared a little, and notwithstanding the tremendous load and the weather, this swing made the trip in record time. Just as the swing arrived at the camp, the storm let up and tarred. Work began immediately unloading the shipment in preparation for its emplacement. Covers were removed, crates opened. None of the excitement affected Mukluk in the least. Boxes of piping and wiring, each item carefully labeled, were opened so that each unit would be available when needed. Major components shipped in pieces because of weight limitations were reassembled before being moved into the trenches. The condenser, 15 tons of steel, was one of the first units to be moved into the tunnel prepared to house it. When the condenser was slowly winched forward, small tracked rollers supported its entire weight. Next, still mounted on its special sled, the vapor container was eased down the ramp by three tractors, one in front pulling and two in back to keep it from slipping. To bear the weight of the vapor container, the reactor building was constructed around a framework of steel beams. The floor was of heavy planking mounted on other steel beams. We had to use hand rigging methods, the best we could do under the confined conditions, 
to put the nuclear equipment in place. Every step had to be checked very carefully since the power plant had been pre-fitted in the United States and must be emplaced within a tolerance of one-eighth of an inch. The power plant consisted of four basic elements. A nuclear heat source, equipment that would convert the heat energy into electrical energy, and a system to dispose of excess heat all regulated by an extensive network of instruments and controls. The last buildings to be assembled were those that would contain the nuclear sections. These shells were built around the nuclear system equipment only after every major component had been put in place. The next phase was to be the activation of the nuclear power plant. Wearing the white safety hat is Captain Jim Barnett, in charge of this operation, who will tell you about this critical phase. We took every precaution in the book, and some that weren't there, to make sure this would work right the first time. When the entire system had been carefully tested, it was put into operation. We were then ready to begin loading the reactor core. One by one, the fuel elements were removed from the barrels in which they'd been shipped carefully separated from one another. Each of these bars containing approximately 500 grams of uranium-235 was then unwrapped, inspected, and wiped clean of any dust. Crewmen wearing protective clothing began to load the fuel elements into a fuel storage tank. This preliminary test proved that the fuel elements, when assembled, would not go active prematurely. After each element was in place, instruments were read and an evaluation of reactivity was made and reported over loudspeakers. The crewmen were protected by a shield of approximately eight feet of water as they lowered the fuel elements into the fuel storage tank. Later, each of these steel and uranium bars would be transferred underwater to the nearby reactor core. Every step of the testing was meticulously monitored and regular announcements made to the workers assigned to the loading crew. Total U-235 content of the assembled core is 13.376 kilograms. Coefficient of reactivity 0.935. The assembly is still subcritical. When all preliminary tests were completed, we began to transfer the fuel elements one by one and started loading the reactor core. As each fuel element went into place, the count rate of neutrons released gradually increased. Within the core, to prevent the reactor from inadvertently going critical, control rods were in place. This gradual activation of the pile took almost nine hours. In this tense atmosphere, we changed crews twice. Above us, it was dark and miserable. With the approach of winter, the sun was preparing to set for the year. Finally, our meters reported a significant increase of reactivity. The whole camp was standing by, waiting, tense. By the ninth hour, the last fuel element had gone into place. A plot showed the location of every bar. Then the control rods were gradually withdrawn until the reactor went critical at 6.52 a.m. Now here it is. With all five control rods withdrawn 6.24 inches, p.m. 2A went critical at 0652 hours. Within the next few weeks, the final touches were put to Camp Century. Today, powered by its nuclear reactor, this unique installation is a completely modern community, deep under the ice. This is a far cry from the primitive Jamesway huts of the work camp, where three showers served 250 men. Here, there are showers for all, and facilities for every modern convenience. A 
Among the many sophisticated facilities at Camp Century is the dispensary, complete in every detail. For while the remote research community is isolated by 150 miles of ice and snow, its medical capabilities can cope with almost any emergency. It also has a small chapel for regular religious services. And it boasts the largest deep freeze in the world. Here is enough food to feed the camp for several months. Everything from steak to fruit salad. The modern spacious kitchens provide a well-balanced and appetizing menu. To satisfy the enormous appetites that working in this climate produces means extra rations, but there's always more than enough. Except for the fact that they have no windows, the men of Camp Century live exactly as do other soldiers. Their quarters are modern, spacious, comfortable, and are not lacking in any detail. Today, Camp Century is being operated as a year-round Arctic research center. The men who built the camp have long since been replaced by military and civilian scientists from the Polar Research and Development Program. As part of man's efforts to probe deeper and deeper into the secrets of the universe, an elaborate program of tests and experiments is being carried out. At this very moment, somewhere, men from Camp Century are at work, within the city itself or out on the ice cap. Only Mukluk remains from the original contingent. This is the story of Camp Century, of the army engineers who carved out the underground city, of the many other men of the United States Army who made this project possible, and of man's never-ceasing quest for knowledge.